Hi everyone, so I'm going to do um, some videos, a couple of videos on a different topic, um, which is God is in the conscience business. Um, so the first one will be about God's conscience and the second one, or second and third if, if it stretches out, will be about our conscience. Um, it's people... Uh, are probably not usually taught very well about the conscience and what purpose it serves and and if it's not handled correctly what the implications are um, we certainly every in everything we do our conscience is involved um, even just listening to a sermon uh, you can go to church and your conscience can be become defiled by listening to a sermon um, or it can be uh, relieved of <laughs> of burdens of condemnation. Um, so it's an ever-present thing, and it's really good to understand what its role is, um, because it can really make a difference in your life if you understand it properly and and see how it. it works within us and um, so the first video I was going to talk about God's conscience which you know people might be like well what's that's not in the Bible is it well um, without using the word conscience you can see um, how God has kept a pure conscience in the way that he has saved us um, and you know we're made in his image so uh, if he has a conscience we have one because he did um, he's made us in in his image uh, maybe we don't have absolutely everything that he has or we're made with everything that he has but um, I do think he has a conscience um, so uh, let's start with God's conscience. Um, so in Romans 6.23, uh, it says the wages of sin is death. And Romans 2, five, verses 5 and 12, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law and as many have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law so God brought about uh, I mean from, from the start the wages of sin is death you know Adam sinned and all all of his offspring were under the same curse um, and the wage of that sin was death um, that was before the law was brought in and then G um, God brought in the law and um, he will judge according to that law and he, is, he has righteous judgment um, and if, even if you've sinned and you weren't under that Mosaic law you still perish um, because you've sinned uh, the Gentiles have uh, a law unto themselves, so they they make up their own rules, and um, their conscience judges them when they break their own rules. Um, not to say that they say, "Oh, every sin is okay." No, they 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 know their conscience tells them, "This is not right. That's not right. You shouldn't do that," and um, they do it anyway. Um, so whatever law you're under, whether it's your own law or um, the Mosaic law, you're judged by the law. And that's righteous judgment. Um, God made up the rules and he said, this, this is what happens if you've sinned and he carries out the judgment and it is righteous judgment. So then you go, well, then how 
how can we be justly, how can we avoid that judgment and for it to be just and uh, righteous, ju um, yeah, just, sorry. Um, well, let's look at that. Um, 1 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus became the substitution um, for our death and he became sin so that that sin would be judged in his body and it would be righteously judged. And everything that God and Jesus did do is righteous because they are God and um, have done nothing against um, the rules basically that they set up or that God set up and so we are righteously saved because the, the sin debt has been paid by Jesus' substitutionary death. Um, So even though we didn't um, receive that death, I mean, we, we have been crucified with Christ, but um, we don't, you know, the second, the second death, uh, um, you, you know, there's the, there's the first resurrection, the second resurrection, and those in the second resurrection are resurrected to judgment and they are all the people who never believe the gospel. So... Um, um, we should have been numbered among those, but um, Jesus died for us so that we wouldn't have to die that um, eternal death. Um, so back in the Old Testament, um, in the you know under the Mosaic Law, um, God did wink at sin. He set up this system um, of sacrifices and uh, to purge the conscience of sin and to point the way to what Jesus would do on the cross. Um, so Acts 17.30 tells us that at the times of this ignorance God winked at and but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Um, so this, this system of sacrifice that he set up for the Israelites um, it, it couldn't actually uh, take away their sins. It was just a picture. Um, so Hebrews 10, 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. So he couldn't do that forever. Um, Jesus had to come and do the real thing so that um, even the Israelites under the law um, they're not, they're not eternally saved by their faith in bulls and goats' blood. Um, they're saved by their faith in the seed, the seed of the woman that was promised um, and ultimately that, that was Jesus. And so um, when Jesus died, he went into, uh, is it? went into hell or, you know, the place where all of the, not hell, but, you know, not the bad, bad hell, but like, is it Hades? I don't know. Um, wherever the, the Jews or anyone who believed uh, in or had faith in God, um, wherever they would go when they died or went when they died, um, God went down, Jesus went down and preached to them that he was that sacrifice and that he has accomplished on the cross with his shedding of his blood um, the remission of sins permanently and has been taken away and they would have you know been saved by that not by their um, actual act of doing sacrifices it was sort of a, a future salvation that they um, that they didn't receive until Jesus actually died. 
I hope that's right. I think that's right. But if it's not, sorry. Um, it goes along those lines anyway. Um, so, you know, God could not continue to have a sacrificial system um, because it, it didn't deal with sin properly. And so it would have, you know, ruined his conscience if he had left it in such a state and Jesus never died. He couldn't justly bring all these people into heaven and say, you know, you're clean, you're saved, you've got no sin on you. Satan would say, no, that didn't work. Didn't, didn't you say in Hebrews 10 that it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins? So it's not, it wasn't possible and it had to, it couldn't truly occur their salvation until Jesus actually died and shed his blood and put his blood on the, um, on the mercy seat. Um, so Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Um, he didn't just uh, go to his, go and find some friends and say, hey, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but you know, um, I'll give you a free ticket to heaven and um, don't tell anyone because, you know, I'm not supposed to do it this way. Um, you actually deserve to die, but I'm, I'm going to let you in for free and um, we'll just keep it a secret between us. Um, no, in order to save or rightly save anyone, he had to die for the whole world. Um, and in Matthew 13:44. This parable is, it refers to that. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. So he gave everything that he had in order to buy the field, because there was a treasure in that field that he wanted. So we are the treasure in the field. Um, and he, he bought it with his blood, his death. And that means that the whole field, the sins of the whole field, the whole world, were paid for by his death. Um, but he knew that not all would believe. So therefore only, you know, the treasure is, is only part of the field, it's not um, the whole field. Uh, and First John 2, 1 to 2, My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Uh, and he is the prop propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus Christ the righteous, he is righteous. And why is that? Because he paid for the sins of the whole world with his death, with his blood. Um, and he, his blood is the propitiation, or he is the propitiation for our sins. Um, and therefore he has the right to save us. He has the right to the whole field. But um, he set it up so that only those who actually believed he did that would receive the inheritance and the salvation and um, have our spirit joined with his, the Holy Spirit. Um, Romans three nineteen to 26. Now that we, sorry, hang on a sec. Okay. So now, now we know that what things soever the law saith is saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall be no flesh there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So yeah, everyone in the whole world 
can't claim that they don't deserve the punishment, the righteous judgment of God. Um, the, the law says you're guilty. And if it's your own law, your own law says you're guilty. Um, and you cannot be justified by anything you do. Um, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no dis difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare that his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare I say at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus so he should righteously judge us but he did righteously judge us um, um, by his death on the cross and his, his blood. Um, he took our sins into himself. He, um, he became sin and righteously judged that sin by having himself uh, die and shed his blood. So he has just, justly, righteously judged our sin. Um, and paid the price for it in his own body. So he is just and the justifier of us because we believe what he did, what he said he did. Um, so the propitiation, um, with, you know, the blood is on the mercy seat in heaven. And this um, is a constant... Um, reminder to the angels in heaven of the righteousness of God and why we are able to be saved and brought into the holiest of all, the holy of holies. Um, so it's a demonstration to the angels. Um, you know, the, the cherubs, cherubim around the mercy seat, um, they're looking at the propitiation and they're constantly saying, holy, 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 um, his blood is holy and it has made us holy. That's why we can enter that the holiest of all. And it's through that blood that we can enter there, that um, place. Um, so we know God is righteous and just. He knows he is righteous and just. He has satisfied his own conscience regarding whether or not we can be saved. And it turns out we can. <laughs> Which is fantastic but Satan doesn't agree with that he thinks God is wrong Jesus is wrong um, he thinks we should all go to hell with him um, Revelation 12 10 and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. That's all he does. He just accuses us all the time and he knows that it does us damage in our conscience. And so that's his biggest weapon against us, keeping us away from God, um, is accusing us and defiling our conscience. So while it says here that he accuses the brethren, it really comes down to um, accusing God of unjustly forgiving sinners. But because we are in Christ and have his righteousness, Satan accuses both of us, both us and Christ equally, really. Um, so 1 Corinthians 1.30 But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So we're in Christ, we've become one with him, we're part of the body of Christ. And Satan's accusations against Christ are against us and vice versa. 
And the last one I want to look at is um, John 8, 1 to 11, which is the story of the woman who was accused of adultery. And um, they, they basically didn't accuse, weren't really there to accuse her. She was just a tool um, to bring accusation against Jesus and trying to catch him out. Um, so Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives and early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that, that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. But when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, being at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So um, that's an example of basically the Satan behind those men being the accuser of the brethren. Um, but instead, it ended up being those men whose consciences were um, defiled and accused. Um, and they felt bad and they went away. Um, or they felt guilty and they went, went away. I don't think they were... I don't think they actually felt bad for doing it, except that it made them feel guilty. Um, and people speculate that Jesus was writing something about what they had done themselves, because they no doubt had all been guilty of adultery themselves. Um, who knows, he could have been writing down the names of the women that they'd been with. <laughs> that would be enough to freak you out and send you on your way. Um, so, uh, yeah, Jesus is Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he righteously paid the price of sin under the law, making himself a substitute for our death, therefore righteously judging our sin. Yet because he paid the price, we have life when we believe in his work on the cross and his righteousness is imputed to us. God's conscience is pure. He has done nothing wrong in saving us. He followed the rules that he set up. And the only reason Satan continues to accuse him and us is because he's stupid and angry and a sore loser. Um, all right, so that's all I wanted to say about God's conscience. Um, and the next video will be about our conscience and there's plenty of verses talking about the conscience in the Bible so I, I don't know if I'll get it all into one it might be too long so we'll see um, alright I hope that blesses you bye